All right, so let's just go ahead and get started. You guys can keep polling and we'll leave this up as I go through this uh, very brief intro. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christy Mora. I am the Associate Director of Marketing at Generis. I am thrilled to be with, here with you today for the survival webinar. We love puns around here. Um, here at Generis, we believe that missions is the heart of a church on display for the community, a tangible way of sharing God's love through serving our neighbors. And if you are anything like me, you may be watching the news and reading about hurting communities or just looking around and feeling the weight of the hurting world and wonder, what can I do? Uh, how do I even begin to help? And once we are engaged, uh, how do we continue to capture that enthusiasm and transform it into long-term sustainable impact? So if you or your church feels in, is sharing this, then you are in great company here. Um, today, our hope is that you walk away with a new framework that will help you structure missions and outreach programming in your church, understand how to work with the missions and outreach board to plan for long-term impact and receive practical guidance on how to reimagine short-term mission trips. Um, so <clears throat> before I get started with introducing our amazing panel of speakers here, I just wanna take care of some quick housekeeping. Um, so you will have both the chat and the Q&A feature available to use for you to use. The Q&A feature is for questions that you will have for our panelists who will be answering them. In the chat bar, I'm gonna send you some information, so feel free and copy any links that I share with you so you can keep for future reference. Um, you can also utilize the chat for conversations and to introduce yourself. So let's go ahead and do that now. In the, drop, in the chat bar, drop your name, church, and city and state where you are located so we can get to know you. Um, and I also wanna point out on my video, you'll see my email address, which is christy.mora at generis.com. If you lose the Zoom call or anything happens, feel free to uh, drop me a line and I can send you the link to get you back here or just answer any questions that you may have. And uh, while you guys are all telling us who you are and where you're from, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to our panel here. So kick kicking off our conversation is Brian Jones. Um, I was gonna say, wait, Brian. <laughs> Brian is the mission strategist for our effective ministry team here at Generis. Prior to joining our team, Brian was the founder and executive director of Innovate Studios, where he had an, the incredible opportunity of pioneer, pioneering a church missions model called the Shark Tank for Churches. Innovate Studios has helped churches reinvigorate their missions programs, re-engage their congregations, and revitalize their communities through the successful funding and launch of 21 social ventures. Kind of awesome. Uh, prior to his to that work, uh, prior to his consulting work, Brian served at First United Methodist Church in Newnan, Georgia, and Colonial Church in Edina. Edina. Ah, I knew I said it wrong. <laughs> and I, for one, am thrilled to have Brian on our team and to now offer the innovative process through Generis. And although Brian uh, and, and many of our consultants have real life experience in both church and ministry. They've fought the battles and proudly wear those t-shirts. We know how important it is to hear from people who are also boots on the ground, um, just like all of you. So I'm um, really excited to have Danielle Jones and Rustin on this call. So Danielle is the Minister of Congregational Life and Mission at YZ. Can I say that right? Thank you, Community Church. Uh, Danielle's passion in ministry is making space for people to grow in community and grow in their relationship with God. She believes that digging deeper into who we are, what has shaped us, and God's deep love for us sets us free to serve the world. Amazing. And Rustin Comer, did I say that correctly? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good today. Minister of Faith and Formation at YZ Community Church as well. Rustin's passion in ministry is helping people tear down the walls that have placed themselves in with, with and God within. He loves helping people find a deeper sense of wholeness in their life and faith, as well as creating processes, strategies, and systems that lead to better organizations. I love that as well. I am a process system person. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Brian. But before that, Brian, should we show the results of our poll? Yeah, please do. All right. So we asked you guys, which is most relevant to your church right now? Um, and you didn't have a lot of options, just two right now. So one, a missional response to current events, and or two, preparing a long-term strategy for missions. 
And it seems that 81% of you are feeling the same when it comes to a mission resp response to current events. So. Okay. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Okay. So it's my turn. <laughs> well, hi, hi, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. I'm going to have uh, how this have just a few um, just to set the overall tone, uh, just some high level stuff. And then we're going to bounce back and forth. Uh, uh, Rustin is a very dear friend of mine and I am married to Dan Danielle. So we have brought in some ringers to talk about missions and um, it's our heart and um, call the church is what, what we do for, among, and, and with others. Uh, so let's get into it. I'm going to share the screen here and we'll have a couple of slides. And I'll do this quickly so that we'll have plenty of time to do Q&A. All right, Christy, how am I doing? Everything looks awesome. All right. Beautiful slide. <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> All right, so what we want to do is I am going to tell you two stories. Uh, I'm going to put everything into a box and then I'm going to share one unusual point of data. So two stories, I'm going to put everything into a box, and then I'm going to share one point of data. So here's the first story is this is a very common story in the missions world is the starfish story. And it goes a little something like this, like I came along a beach, and there were all these starfish washed ashore. And, you know, my heart was broken. And I realized I didn't know what to do to help, but I could help this one starfish. Um, and it's a big hearted story to talk about how, you know, each of us can, can make a difference, um, you know, one starfish at a time. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, I've always hated that story. Um, I'm not really wired that way. Uh, so my first thought is like, why, why would you not organize volunteers to help a hundred starfish? You know, like, why, why would you just do one? Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. And I want to talk about relief restoration and renovation. Um, again, this is a oversimplification, but these are kind of big categories of, of mission. Uh, relief is that short term, um, give a person a fish, uh, which is another common missions thing, you know, give a person a fish versus teach a person to fish. Uh, relief is short term to meet immediate needs to meet, uh, to help against immediate suffering suffering. Relief can be as simple as giving a person a hug after a horrible cancer diagnosis. Um, relief is often thought about it in terms of hurricanes, but that's relief work. And that's a short term uh, mission response, uh, big hearted mission response. Restoration is restoring things how they should be. Um, restoration could be something like mental health services to help someone um, be re to, to be re reunited with their family right or addiction counseling to help um could be rebuilding that's restoration and renovation is tearing things down to the studs or maybe even down to the foundation and rebuilding it anew um and so in our story about the starfish relief is taking that starfish and brushing the sand off of it um restoration is tossing that starfish back into the ocean and renovation is walking out into the tide, uh, out into the water to see why all those starfish are washed up to begin with. And so again, those are broad categories, but hopefully that story will help frame what we're gonna talk about. Uh, now I'm gonna butcher some Hebrew. I am horrible at Hebrew. So we're gonna talk about the Old Testament for a little bit. Uh, Leket, Shekah, and Peah. Uh, gleanings, forgotten produce in the corners of the field. And these Hebrew terms, um, they're all over the Old Testament, but mainly in the book of Ruth is where you kind of get to see them come to life. And if you remember the book of Ruth, um, Boaz uh, looked out to her and he told his workers, Boaz, the, the farm owner, said, told his workers to make sure you leave some for Ruth. Um, so look at that's gleanings. And so in the Old Testament law, what that meant is if the harvester was harvesting and they dropped some, they weren't allowed to pick it up. That what that had fallen, that what had fallen was for the poor to come around behind. Uh, forgotten produce was a law in the Old Testament times that when you shook that olive tree, 
um, the olives that fell down, you could harvest, but you couldn't shake that tree twice because what was left was for the poor. And the corners of the field was a law in Old Testament times that uh, that the landowners would have to set aside a, a portion of their field specifically for the poor. Uh, now, as you know, Old Testament times, uh, the, the temple was the government and all that was mixed in. That was, so this was the government social safety net, uh, to put it in our terms, which was said, hey, um, the gleanies, the forgotten produce, the corners of the field, there was laws to say we should care for the poor. Um, and so that was, that was interesting. And so when Jesus is talking in the New, New Testament, he's reminding folks about this care for the poor when he talks in Matthew 25 and about the least of these. He is just speaking to the temple laws of the time. So that is big stuff, but there was another one, which was Masar, and that's the 10th part. Uh, and so while those others were corporate, the 10th part is what we commonly refer to as tithe. And so that was for individuals. And so what this is, individuals should go above and beyond what we should do as a society as well. And so that deep, rich care for the poor and the least of these. And I love these, this quote, and this is from the Roman Emperor Julian in the fourth century. Uh, so this is shortly after the time of Christ. And this, this is the Roman emperor of all people that's saying that the Galileans are caring not only for their own, but they're caring for, the, for everyone. And essentially Julian was like, they're making us look bad. They're doing so much to care for those around them. And I think that's just uh, inspiring how gee, these words to care for the poor has just uh, influenced us as Christians and our culture in so many ways. So those are two quick stories. Um, the story about the starfish, story from the scripture, Ruth and Boaz, and this is where we put things into a box. Um, so everyone stay with me here. So I realize that this is an oversimplification. Um, I have a I have a three by three version of this where everything is in nine boxes and it gets too complicated. So I realize that this is oversimplification, but stick with me here because I think as pastors, this will help you um, kind of get a handle on some of the things that you do as mission work. So this is a typical two by two grids. I love them. Uh, you'll see across the bottom, it says existing systems maintained. And then if you go to the right, the new equilibrium created. Now, if you go up the other axis, it's indirect or direct. So here's what I mean by this. So in the lower left, the existing systems maintained and indirect, um, those are your donors, right? Those are your social supporters, folks that support things um, in the church or outside the church with their, with their generosity. Um, now, most of the generosity goes toward existing systems, right? Um, the things that the giving the year after your year that, that these folks have given to the food shelf or these folks have given to the homeless shelter or given to the mission project in the church. Um, now, when I say existing systems maintained, it doesn't mean that they don't want to improve or get better, right? So the food shelf uh, might say, hey, in 2019, we served 100 clients, but in 2020, we're going to try to serve 110 clients or, uh, you know, we're going to try to have a 10% in efficiency increase, right? And so existing systems maintain and try to approve, but it's the same system, right? Uh, donors are indirect, right? They're not in the trenches getting their hands dirty. Um, so let's go up the axis, and this is in the upper left. This is direct. So existing systems and direct, these are your social services. These are your practitioners. And often the church, churches are the big donors, social supporters. Um, churches also get involved in the social services as well sending volunteers down to the food shelf, right? Or sending volunteers down to, uh, Danielle just did a, a food drive for an organization here in Twin Cities called Community Emergency Services. Uh, CES, they do a nice thing where they have church volunteers come in and serve as client advocates uh, to interview and to build relationships with clients that need social services. Um, social services are also can be governmental, right? Uh, my sister-in-law is a sign language interpreter and she works for the county. It's good work, it's important work. Um, she helps folks who otherwise would be kind of falling through the cracks, right? Um, but this is the existing system. So let's go to the other side. This is a new equilibrium created. Um, and you'll see the, 
the indirect down in the lower right, uh, right in this present moment, that's where we are. Like that's where that's literally where our culture is living right now. Is this the agitators, the social activism, the folks that are that are you know complaining on Twitter to going downtown Minneapolis and marching in a protest, right? It's indirect, um, but what they're doing is they're calling for a new equilibrium. It's like, we want something new. Um, and so let's go up to the final quadrant, and that's the social entrepreneurship, the innovators. And that's where I've spent my last many, many years to working with the folks that they have a new idea, they want a new system, um, but they also are the ones that are ankle deep in mud getting the work done. So those are broad categories, but here's what I want to do is I want to talk about how that looks in your church and how the conversations and the language might be helpful. So here's one. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll do it by the donors. Now imagine you're having these conversations in your church and you're a missions leader or a volunteer coordinator or a pastor. Um, and you have a frustrated person and he's like, our church doesn't do it, doesn't support whatever enough, right? And so what he's saying is that he, he or she give to this cause, give to the mission, he's a doesn't do it as well, right? Um, and so you can think, you know, I support this, so our church should also. When I was a mission pastor, I had those conversations literally daily, those about, hey, I give to this, our church should too, so let me talk to the mission and outreach board, right? Uh, let's go up to the top, the direct, the social services, the practitioners, like our church needs to do more to meet needs, right? So these are human beings who are just wired to volunteer, right? They're just wired to go in and they're the kind of folks that at the bottom of the email, just like I'm seeing on the news, what can I do to help? Or they're talking to your, about your mission outreach board. Like our church needs more ways to volunteer because I like to volunteer and that's what I want the church to be about. All right, now let's go down to the, down to the bottom. Right, now it's hard with our culture, like what's happening right outside uh, our walls, um, everything's through that lens, but just think about it in general terms about kind of the agitators um in your in your church those conversations that you have and as a mission pastor i would have these all the time and they would come up to me after sunday morning and they'd be like some things need to change around here right um or what we're doing isn't working anymore those are the the congregants the folks in your church that are like we want something new um you know, it's likely indirect like they want the pastor to do something but maybe not um but those are the agitators, right? And then the final one, and again, these are the folks that I've worked with is they're like, I see a problem and I'm thinking, of, I'm wrestling with what I can do to help. So hopefully as a pastor, you've probably identified some of those conversations that you've had after service on Sunday or now on Zoom, right? Um, about folks and your missions and outreach and what the church is doing. Now, again, this is all we'll talk about the innovate process, Christy brought it up, but uh, what the Innovate process does is it mobilizes Monday through Friday vocational skills for volunteerism, um, and it taps into uh, donors and venture capitalists to get a social return on investment um, beyond just simply donating money. And then it launches fresh new expressions of missions to rally around. So if you're interested in that, just Google Innovate Studios, and that will tell you of that. So. Two stories, put things in a box, and now a data point. So here's the data point. I picked something that was, you're reading this, that 90% of millennials are looking for work that allows them to have an impact on the world. Pick this for two reasons. One, this 97%, why in the world do they just not round it up to 100? This is across the board. What millennials are looking for is work that allows them to, quote unquote, have an impact on the world. Now I picked something about work or something that would just was just the most banal, non-controversial thing um, because I think this il illustrates the younger generations and how they're wired. And my point of this is if you think that young people aren't looking at your church's mission program, then you're nuts. If millennials are care about 
what Taco Bell does in the world, you better bet that they're looking at your church and seeing what kind of missions they're doing. And so if you want to attract young people, your church, without a doubt, with 97% certainty, better have a missions and outreach program that shows that your church cares about its neighbors, it cares about the world around them, and is doing active, meaningful things to make a change in the world. And I think that's what I all I had. And I'm going to now turn it back to Christy and we're going to go into some crosstalk. Um, I will say as the millennial on the call, um, <laughs> I at least the one showing her camera, um, I completely um, feel that. Um, I'm like, what is a less millennial way of saying that? But it's totally true. I mean, I think this is definitely a time and it has been a time where everyone is looking at how is the church responding? And I know that that is something that um, at least me and my husband also talk about all the time. Like what we, we are expectantly watching what churches and other organizations are doing and trying to figure out how do we mobilize and we can donate and we love to do that. We love to align with um, different organizations, but I know for us, we are both creatives and we think, what can we do? So at least that's, that's where I'm at. So I affirm that. And um, I just shared with everyone some information about Innovate. So feel free to save that link for little for later. Yeah. And, and I purposely didn't share like the bad news data, right? That, you know, Generis' partnership with Barna and Glue and all this bad data that younger generations have looked at the church already and they've found it wanting and they've left the church, right? Um, so I purposely didn't share that bad news, but just to highlight, yeah. Uh, if, if churches want to attract a younger generation, it's, it's missions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who do you want to, who, who's going next? Rustin? I think we're going to, I think we're going to bounce it to Rustin. And so Rustin, Rustin uh, is going to talk about what this means in the context of like maybe some hyper. So, so getting really local, really. Yeah. Really I mean, so for me, I think um, what this moment in our history uh, requires of us um, in many ways is to refocus hyper locally um, for multiple reasons. Number one, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So the idea of traveling to um, South America or to Mexico or other places, unless you can drive there, is um, extremely limited. And most of our parishioners and community members would not do it anyway. Um, but secondly, in light of um, all the issues around race that have come to service here in Minneapolis and kind of globally um, and a renewed interest in that space, it gives us the opportunity to kind of reroute within, you know, I came from an urban setting in Los Angeles. Our missions focus in Los Angeles was hyper-local because what we believed as a church was that until we rerouted re in our local community and the justice work that was happening there, we weren't ready to look abroad. Um, and what that did was it captured the imagination of our congregation to, to look for how each of these four quadrants in many ways that Brian shared, how each of them live within our neighborhood. So, um, for example, mm -hmm. one of the things that popped up for us is we didn't know, but we had two nonprofit, um, foster care agencies in our local community. And we had people in our church who were foster kids and they wanted to serve in a way that they were raised, right? And make a difference in that impact. So we partnered with one of them and that became a hyper-local mission engagement for us. Um, that later turned into some social entrepreneurship as some of those foster kids were aging out of the system and were trying to change the system. Then the church invested in their social entrepreneurship mm -hmm. of trying to remake the way um, that foster care engages young adults. So I think for me, there's no better time, truthfully, than in this moment to become hyper-local hyper and really to push the edges of the justice conversation and action within our local churches than this very moment. Yeah, for a church to be just, you know, to your point, just rooted in the community. And uh, I like what also what you mentioned about those initiatives were bubbling up from the congregation, from the, the passions, experiences from the congregation. Um, Absolutely, and and part of what we said as we started reimagining our mission 
impact within our neighborhood was we literally like, and it was risky. I was a redeveloping congregation. Um, and we just said, we, we literally stopped everything we were doing before and said, we're going to listen and look both in our to into our congregation and into our neighborhood. And then we're going to intentionally respond. And we took on two, um, new partners, mission partners every year for eight years. So we went from having zero to 16 mission partners by the time I left that church in LA, but all of them came out of people's interests within the community that were actual needs within our neighborhood. Okay. Say, say that. I think that's good. So, so took on two new mission partners per year over eight years. So this strategic kind of slow, like let's look around our church in the community. Let's talk through our congregation and kind of the strategic, and then let's slowly add these on as long-term relational ways to serve. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And for us that like that piece that you just connect connected to the relationship piece um, was a deal breaker, right? Like if we couldn't have relationships, right. Right, then it wasn't right. a partner for us. We weren't looking for places where we could just pour money um, because that's too easy for our churches and our communities that we don't invest in the same way. And so what we were looking for were um, relationships that we could invest in that were mutual relationships um, and that were invested. So like one of the first ones was this foster care agency that uh, was called Penny Lane. And it came from a council member in our church who had grown up, in, grown up in the foster care system. She was driving to a vision meeting at our church and NPR had a, a program on talking about that at 18, that kids age out of the foster care system. And she mm. came in weeping to the council and she said, this is it, we've got to do something. I was a foster kid and had somebody not done something, I wouldn't be where I am today. And none of us in the room knew she was a foster kid. Like none of us. And it was a small church and we still didn't know because it was a part of her life that she hadn't shared. And it mm -hmm. gave this moment of like, wait, here's a real need in our community that then touched the hearts of us and were rooted in our own um, faith expression and experience. Um, and that started simply by the first thing we did was we called them and we said, what do you need? And they mm -hmm. said, most of our kids have never had a birthday party. Will you throw them a monthly birthday party? And so we spent, the first year of our relationship with them, just doing a single birthday party event once a month for all the kids whose birthdays were in that month. And we did hardcore birthday parties, right? Bouncers and, um, you know, nail salons and stuff like that coming in and making the kids feel special. And part of what we heard in those moments where kids say things like, you know, I've never had my own birthday cake. And so then we started making a birthday cake for every kid, not just one big birthday cake, but every kid got the birthday cake they wanted and picked. So it was that kind of relational dialogue to where now that church in LA is doing a ton of relational ministry with this foster care agency because we built trust and respect in that space where they, we knew we were safe and we knew they were safe and um, it's created a deep, long, impactful relationship. And so, so many things happen there in that conversation. Uh, I get deep in the relationships in your church, like the community within your church, you, you got to know your congregants and, wholly new ways and deep meaningful stuff um and the lower left quadrant the donors that can be a very transactional right mm -hmm. um danielle and i came from a church that literally gave away hundreds of thousands of dollars to mission and a lot of it was largely transactional but to go to that relational is such a rewarding thing um and then it serves as a great segue to danielle uh, because, you know, you mentioned kind of that strategic mapping out of adding those partners. And so Danielle is right, you know, neck deep in working with Mission Outreach Board, lay leaders and kind of developing that system. So if you could speak to that. Yeah, I think um, a wise person once said to me that um, passion is not strategy. And the thing I think that um, I have learned is that, you know, mission brings with it passion and passion matters, right? It matters to listen yeah, to our conversations and to see what they're passionate about. And we can't necessarily respond to everything 
um, because we won't be able to have the maximum impact that I think we can have. So I think Rustin talking about relationships, that is key. I think the, the second thing is looking for partners that will be in relationship. It's important though to remember being in relationship is, is um, listening to each other. It's not holding um, organizations accountable. I have found with a lot of mission groups I've worked with, they wanna kind of hold the organization accountable you know, to use their money a certain way. I think in relationship, we have to release organizations to, to, and trust them to do their best work and ask them how we can be helpful and, and what they most need. Um, the second thing is I think we have to get our congregations and our, and our boards on the same page. And I found that um, learning together is the way to do that. Whether it's reading a book like When Helping Hurts together to have a common language to gather around as yeah, you consider indeed. who your partners will be or toxic charity is another one. Um, it, having those book conversations can really help you tease out what matters most to your congregation which leads into the next one, which I think is um, you need to remember who your church is. So we are currently in, in a context, Wyzetta is about 10 miles from the city um, of Minneapolis. So we're an outer ring suburb. We're like a second or third ring suburb. So what we are uniquely positioned to do is very different than what an inner city Minneapolis church is positioned to do right now. So we need to, I think, simultaneously remember who we are, what are the unique gifts that Wyzetta Community Church has to offer the world, um, and what are we uniquely positioned to do as well? Because the truth is we, you know, it, it, sort of what Rustin said, I think, illustrates that point. Uh, these, I think the Holy Spirit bubbles up things within your context and community um, that become passions for your community. And one of the things that we like to say is you, you want to help your church do something bigger together than individuals can do by themselves. So the, the truth about our community is that our church, these people give away a ton of money, um, but we're trying to give them an experience that they can't have by themselves just writing a check, um, but an experience that builds new relationships within the community, you know, within the church itself, within the community around us, and hopefully extends out into the world. Um, and then you have these moments when the world speaks to you and determines your mission mm -hmm. strategy. So um, obviously we keep talking about Minneapolis, but living in Minneapolis right now, we absolutely cannot ignore what has happened in the context of George Floyd's murder, and then the ripple effect that has had in our community is absolutely extraordinary. So a, a week ago Sunday, as we're living in this, experiencing this, Rustin and myself and many other church members going into the city to see for ourselves, to listen to stories, um, to be, you know, to be a part somehow of what was happening, we determined that we needed to do something as a starting point. Um, and that doing, and actually it was a lot of millennials that reached out to me and said, what are we going to do? We got to do something. Um, and so I think what I did was look for a partner that knows better than we know what needs to be done. And so I, I kind of connected with CES, which Brian referred to and said, what do you need? I don't, we don't want to do anything you don't need, but I do think in this moment for our congregation, a starting point was having a quick actionable item that we're now hoping is gonna lead into some learning together. So we're, we're wanting to do some book studies and some groups and conversations around racism and how to become an anti-racist um, so that we can then, I think, grow and expand the ways we do justice, not just as a church, but in our daily lives all the time. Um, so I think discerning these moments, there are moments when your congregation needs to learn before they can do. I think there's moments where your congregation needs to do something before they're open to learning. Um, and I think determining that together is sort of that uh, listening to the Holy Spirit that, that really, I think, matters and gives you direction um, in these transformational moments. And don't waste these moments. I mean, shame on us in Minnesota if we waste this moment. So um, 
you can check back on us and see how we've done. <laughs> right, please do. Um, that's actually good. Uh, Rustin, I don't know if you've seen the q and I think that's a good segue um, mm -hmm. that Aaron has a question that I think is a good one uh, to respond to based upon what you said and then what, what Daniel added to. Um, yeah. And so essentially as more affluent areas of the Twin Cities, what are the opportunities for mission? So identifying problems, calibrate, calibrating possessions, discovering passions um, that you see in your immediate context uh, that's hyper-local. Uh, and the second part, but how do you recommend partnering with urban or any inner city ministries while avoiding the great white knight mistake of helping in a way that hurts? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think Danielle can also yeah, answer a good in that space. Yeah. Like, um, you know, for me, I've been, my, I've served in three cities um this one is suburban for sure um my church in los angeles was very urban and my church in boston was very urban um and each of them required a different response for what it meant to root in that neighborhood right like part of what it means for danielle and i to root in yz is we do have to pay attention to our affluence in ways that i've never had to do in ministry in 22 years um and we have to understand what moves our community. Um, and so I, I appreciate that question a lot, Aaron. Um, so for me, uh, hyper-local here still really does mean Minneapolis, like more than uh, YZ. Um, we do a lot of things in ministry to meet the needs of YZ, um, but it's for me not much of a, a mission front because of the need raised there. Um, for, for me, in terms of avoiding the great white knight reality of this, it is about relationship and partnership. Like, I personally don't believe we should do anything in mission that wasn't asked from us by the place we're working alongside, mm -hmm. right? So when Danielle called and said, what is it you need? Mm -hmm. We only did what they needed, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we took the direction from them and... Um, that really matters, like in terms of how we go about partnering. I think a lot of times our inclination is, you know, an example of that, like we used to do these short-term mission trips and we still do these short-term mission trips with a more in um, Mexico building houses, more ministries. And a more about 15 years ago changed their entire strategy because part of what they realized was that they were hurting their community instead of helping their community. Um, and that took their awareness of what, how they were partnering over the last 30, 40 years to get to that point. Um, and so I think that's true also in urban settings where we want to partner, we really have to listen first. Um, if we need to act as we did and Danielle lifted up, like if we need to act in a moment to, to engage our community and what, being a person of faith means, then that's where having some pre partnerships kind of thought through help. Like Danielle knew people at this organization to reach out to, which is part of the job of us as ministers is we, you know, we partner first. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, the only thing I'd add to that is I think the other thing that we've tried to do, you know, this, I think this incident, frankly, raised our community's awareness in a new way to going into the inner city mm -hmm. Our, our local partner has been a partner in Plymouth because the, the thing about why is that is it's a 3,000 person town next to a 100,000 person town called Plymouth that is much more uh, economically diverse and also racially diverse and religiously diverse too, which is really interesting. And so um, we've partnered with an organization right up the road called IOCP. They work with several low-income housing pockets in Plymouth that have Russian immigrants, Somali immigrants, um, and, and we've done some things there. We've worked with them toward mental health, but I do, again, think this unique moment is calling us into the city, and it is going to be a challenge for us, Aaron, to not be the great <laughs> white knights because that's who these people are, to be perfectly <laughs> honest with you. So we have to show that. I mean, that's where I think leadership matters so much. Somehow, Rustin and myself and the rest of our team, we need to inspire them in new ways by leading forward. And um, again, we'll see how we do. I mean, we are learning hour by hour. Um, 
about how to do this. So it's a good question. I got another question. question. Uh, yes. And may I share a story first? Please. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit of non sequitur, uh, but we do want to talk about mission trips, short term mission trips in particular, and you brought it up. Um, but I wanted to tell a story about Joy, our, our friend Joy. Um, and so Joy is, she is in her late 20s now. Um, but when she was 18, she was sexually assaulted. And so uh, that changed the, the course of her life. Um, and in her words, she felt like God was calling her to help others in this experience. Th those were her words. Um, so long story short, uh, Joy started a fair trade organization called Fair Needham. So I want to tell you, though, about one of the places in this fair trade to talk about short-term mission trips. So it was in Ethiopia, and Ethiopia had a civil war, um, a lot of AK-47 bullet casings, and um, were just laying around. But there are also a lot of women who were literally literally shunned off to the edge of the village um, because they had been sexually assaulted. And in that culture, it was a shameful thing. And so they literally were forced to live outside city. And so these are biblical examples, the woman at the well, right? And the woman and all these vivid biblical stories of these women who were, who were shunned. Um, but joy, um, before you'd have a lot of short-term mission trips and not to disparage them, big hearted stuff, right? It's like the men and we should help them, right? And so we'd take a short-term mission trip and we'd bring a couple of duffel bags full of stuff, right? Um, and we'd, we'd, you know, serve those women as best we could and not to disparage that, right? I mean, it was big hearted with the best of intentions, but then years later, all that stuff, the malls and the rust ha has destroyed, right? And those women aren't in a meaningfully better place, right? Uh, but Joy was like, no, they, they are beautiful children of God. They are talented. And so she taught them to make jewelry that was sold in America through Fair Needham, through this fair trade collaborative. Well, guess what happened? I mean, suddenly these women who were outcast felt this shame through no part of their own, felt worthless, were suddenly business owners in the town. And they were suddenly elevated to you know some of the most respected people in the town um and so when people mission trips would visit them they weren't visited they weren't visiting people that they felt pity on they were visiting business leaders right and it's like how can we help you support your business and help you flourish and that completely changed the dynamic of those mission trips and how how they are seen and what's interesting Joy didn't grow up in the church. And so even though she felt like God was calling her to help people like that, she came up with a completely different mindset. And so she didn't come with the old church ideas that, that we've had for decades. She came up with a whole new mindset. And so sorry for taking your time, Russell, but I want to share that story on how a short-term mission trip can just be flipped upside down as, a, you know, a, a, away from this like voyeurism of going to like, look at these people, how we pity these folks to, hey, let's go and learn from these business leaders and support them in a way that we can. I love that. And I love Joy, she's awesome. Yeah, she is amazing. She now employs 8,000 women around the world. That's incredible. Um, so we have one more question, but before we go there, um, I love that, Brian. I love what you just said, You, we are, our viewer position has been from pity to empowering them. Um, mm -hmm. I loved that. Uh, that's super inspiring. Danielle, you said something also um, that I, 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 I served in a church for a few years, and I think sometimes uh, leaders feel that because they're, the church is a leader in a community, they have to have all of the answers immediately. Um, and I keep like joking around, but totally serious. This is my first pandemic. Um, I, this is my, there's so many things that I am experiencing for the first time in like the last 12 weeks. And, um, I think it's freeing and hum and, um, humbling to say as a church or church leaders, it's okay not to have all the answers, but to lean on experts so that you can respond, respond well, not be the great white knight 
and, and motivate your congregation. Um, I think that's super inspiring and almost takes, it's like a phew, okay, we don't have to have the answers here. Our job is to respond, but to respond well, which means it's okay to partner and partnership with your community to hear the actual pain that's happening and not Mm -hmm. us naming the pain but hearing it from the community and as the church to be in charge of sharing the pain the need the stories with our congregation to play that bridge so so much goodness happening here um there is a, i'm sorry okay uh there is a question from paul saying what does a relationship look like in partnership do you have any practical examples of that Well, I think um, we are working that out right now as we speak. Um, I think I touched on it a little bit. It is tempting for us as the benefactors maybe giving money to think relationship equals accountability. Um, and it's not that accountability is not important, but I think sometimes mission committees inadvertently burden the organizations that they are helping to um, fund by asking for arduous reports, by, you know, by demanding that all their funding goes to direct mission and not to any- the um, overhead conversation. Exactly, and my, my response to that is always, you know, how much do you think it costs for us to turn the lights on at Was at a Community Church for a month? Um, so I think it's important to remember that, you know, to be helpful in relationship. I find too that we can often, um, I, I guess, I mean, true relationship is listening to each other. It's spending time together. It's inviting people from those ministries to your meetings and it's going into their space to experience what they do and what they see and how they see it. So in ways, the word relationship, I think it takes a lot of time too. Um, right now I'm working on creating some task forces of you know five to seven people from our church to sort of agree to dig deeper with a relationship um, with one of our mission partners for a period of time. Um, and the other thing that we're trying to do to help with those relationships is not, um, is to actually extend funding. So to create three-year partnerships instead of one-year partnerships so that an organization knows they can depend. We just voted to do this with two organizations. Each one will get $90,000 over the next three years. And what we're saying to them is, we are investing in you. You, you we promise that we're gonna give you $30,000 a year for three years. And um, what they're saying to us is, we, um, we wanna get you involved in hands-on ministry and mission where we can. And so we'll work together to do that. Um, so. Yeah, no, you yeah, mentioned would... time, that's so important. Just, exactly. just to have the relationship and, and focus. I always talk about, you know, at Christmas, you get a hundred postcards from organizations that need support. Like the needs are great. And if you have a hundred dollars to give, you could give each organization a dollar, right? But you've spread out your impact and how do you do that relationship? But if you focus on two and have a longer relationship, you can, you can build that, that type of mutual understanding. And I, those would be the two guiding words I would say for any committee or clergy who are having to make these decisions, relationship is about mutuality and about duration, right? Like those two things should be your guiding principles when it comes to discerning relationships. Um, because when you think about relationship and you think about what can I give you, that's not mutuality. So how do you, you know, how do you start thinking about like, how, what does it mean for us to be in this together? That we're collectively, like one of our partners at Danielle's working to partner with is IOCP, which is right here in our community, in Plymouth, Interfaith Outreach Community Partners. Like part of what we wanna to say to them is like, we are your community. Like how do we mutually invest together in the betterment of our neighborhood, right? That's a very different response than what can we give you? Um, and so that mutuality and then duration that Danielle hit on so well, I think really is essential. And in the PDFs that, that we're going to give everyone, we have some extra stuff, some questions to help kind of guide you through this thing that we didn't want to take all the time here, uh, but there'll be extra material in that PDF. And then Daryl's question just really quickly, like about how do you pivot to from international to local, hyper-local? 
Um, I'll use an example of um, what our middle school does here. Um, our middle school doesn't take international trips. They only do hyperlocal and that they have a three year commitment. They go Northern Minnesota in the city and Southern Minnesota and they rotate that three ways. And all of those have been long-term mutual partnerships that our middle school ministry has built with local churches and local organizations. And part of what we're helping those local churches do is root in their own communities. So what we say to them is we, we're here to be sweat equity for you, um, but that is beneficial. Only We only wanna be sweat equity for you that's beneficial as you live in this neighborhood, right? Like mm -hmm. we wanna do again what is good for you as you are doing what's good for your community. Um, and so trying to ask some of those questions. And I think that's super, tangible for adults like those of our adults who have taken these international trips and that sort of stuff do the same thing with them what you know find two or three organizations that are driving distance for you that you can make a two or three day or four day experience out of and invest there and maybe choose to do it for more than a year right like even in this covid moment say we're gonna do this for a three-year chunk because there's things that we need to learn about our reality. And like, for example, one of the things Krista found out about our local reality was so much about our indigenous people here in Minnesota as they went North that none of our kids had any idea about, right? They, they hadn't studied yeah, in absolutely. school, they didn't know any of that, and it awakened them for, for that reality. Um, Aaron has dropped in another question. And again, before we wrap, if you have any other last questions, go ahead and drop them in. But he was asking, what are some good questions to help us listen and discern the needs of our local reality? You know, I don't, I don't know if I, if I have specific questions off the top of, top of my head. Um, rather, I could talk about an approach, which, uh, which is a sincere um, Sometimes when we ask questions, we are just waiting uh, for the other person to pause so we can say what we want to say, right? We're not really listening for the answer. We're just waiting for an opportunity to speak. Um, and so rather than the questions, I would talk more about the approach that we take, which is just being humble. And um, I think particularly um, in this time, uh, just humility, ability to listen um, and knowing full well, we don't know the right questions to ask. Um, uh, that we haven't been, even when we've stumbled through the questions, we haven't listened well to the answers that we've received. Um, however, I will bounce to um thoughts on that. Can I just add a who you listen to? to the approach, because I think your approach is right on. I, you know, for me, um, in your four quadrant scenario, you had that bottom right corner, which was the activist. Mm -hmm. And churches in general, big C, have not done a great job in the last hundred years at listening to the activist. Yeah, um, they don't like that quadrant churches. They don't mm -hmm. like that quadrant because it pushes us outside of our comfort. It's uncomfortable, yeah. But that quadrant, generally is the most tapped into the heartbeat of the neighborhood. Hmm. And so they're paying more attention there because that's what, that's their burn. That's their passion. That's their engaged space. And so this is a place I think that you can, you know, part of what I love about Innovate is Innovate empowers people who are usually not empowered in the church to do what they're uniquely gifted to do. Part of what listening to the activist does as we move into hyper-local reality is it gives their voice a platform in really powerful ways that they know better than us and they generally do when it comes yeah. to this hyper-local reality. And so do it with humility, but invite them in and ask them how you can listen. Yeah, and it won't always be polished or articulate or, you know, any of those things. It might just be raw, you know? I mean, it just might be emotional. Um, but I mean, that's real stuff. 
Well, uh, we are approaching time. Out of time. Uh, we are out of time. Pencils but down. <laughs> <laughs> Quiz is done. Turn it in. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for joining the survival webinar. Um, thank you to our panelists. This has been such a great conversation. Um, I, um, am, I, for one, am. I really enjoyed this. I thought this was awesome. You guys shared some great stuff and um, really how to approach the heart of our community, especially in such a time as this where there's so much hurt going on. Um, if you'd like to con connect with any of our panelists, I will be sending a follow-up email with uh, that will include a recording of this webinar, Brian's beautiful slides, and how you can connect to any of our panelists, as well as um, how to get started with the innovate process at your church or basically just have that missions conversation and if you weren't able to get your question asked or you needed a little bit more time to get that question out you will have the opportunity to connect with them um and again thanks for tuning in everyone this was this yeah, is thank good. you this is good yeah thank you christy for hosting us